Hey, we're starting episode two today of Ulysses Nestor, and I'm a little ahead of y'all. I'm on chapter four, and I just finished it yesterday, and I'm uh, trying to catch y'all up to speed. So let's do that. Let's look at Nestor. First, you know, let me say that uh, I've been reading, and I've noticed in these first three chapters, the Telemachia, that Joyce seems to be doing something. He's actually, uh, with each chapter, going deeper and deeper into Stephen's consciousness. And so in the first chapter, maybe Telemachus, he's about 20% in Stephen's head. The rest of it, you know, kind of exterior narration, omniscient narrator, or something like that, third person narration. And uh, the second chapter, Nestor, he's maybe 40, 50%. And then in the next episode, Proteus, He's like 90, 95%, so you're barely even getting the outside world. It's just Stephen's brain, so it's a, it's a wild ride. But the third chapter is a very common point for people to jump ship and say, I don't get this book. It's weird. What's going on? I'm, I have no idea who's he ta- who he's talking about, where this is taking place. What is going on? But settle down. That's what I'm here for, to help you. This chapter ain't too bad. It's just... Uh, Joyce throws you in the middle of it all and he doesn't even say what's going on. He just has this conversation. They're talking about who's talking? What is this? Where where are we? I don't know. So let's start there. Let's take a look at our map for this chapter. Now! Alright, we're back in Dublin. You remember that's where we are. And remember before we were down here near this James Joyce Tower and Museum thing. So we're just going to head a little further to the south to what is now known as the Summerfield House, but it was at the time the Clifton School. That is where Joyce worked for a short time. And it is about a mile, this is about a mile, so he could easily have walked it in about maybe 20, 30 minutes or less. And I think that's what he did. And here's a picture of what it looks like nowadays. And here's what it may have looked like back then inside all black and whitey in the old school era. I don't know if this is actually the interior. This is just some picture I found online, but I'm going to imagine this is kind of what it looks like. So that's where we are. And now let's talk about the title. Nestor, what does that mean? What is that name? What is that word? What is that? Nestor in the Odyssey. So Telemachus, young Telemachus, he's like 22. He's like, the war's been over. The Trojan War's been over for 10 years. Where's my father Odysseus? I know, I'll go ask this guy, Nestor. He was in the war, he's old and wise. I can ask him and find out where Odysseus is, my father. So he travels to see this guy, Nestor, and Nestor's like this, has, he's really a bit long-winded. He gives these long stories, but ultimately what it comes to is he says, I don't know where Odysseus is. You know, like we left and then, I don't know, he's out there somewhere. So good luck, kid. But he also, seems to spur him on and saying like, um, don't put up with these suitors, kid. It's been a while since I read the Odyssey, so that might not be the exact words that he used, but something like that. Anyways, he leaves kind of frustrated, but kind of also uh, gets some advice and some uh, spirit from the guy that, who's giving him his wisdom. So in this chapter, we're going to see something like that, but as always, Joyce is going to play with it and twist it around a little. So Stephen is at work. He left uh, the tower, Martell of Tower. That tap, the, can't talk. That chapter takes place around eight o'clock in the morning, and then this chapter is about ten o'clock. And these times, they don't say that in the chapter, but you kind of can pick it up. There's clues, and also Joyce in his schemas that I talked about before, he actually does say the approximate time. So this is about ten o'clock in the morning. Stephen has walked about a mile to go to work. He works at this uh, private school for boys. And his boss is this guy named Mr. Deasy. So the, the chapter begins in this classroom. Stephen's giving this little lecture on ancient history. A uh, Pyrrhus. Uh, Pyrrhus or Pyrrhus? I forget how it's pronounced. I guess Pyrrhus. That makes more sense because they're talking about it. And they make this little joke about a peer. And the kids don't really get his humor. They, they, uh, you kind of get the impression that they're not really um, too respectful of him. And don't see him as a... A dangerous authority figure as opposed to some other uh, examples uh, and the way they treat Mr. DC and just in general a lot of times in the book you'll see 
uh, the interactions between adults and children are quite different. Sometimes they'll be very respectful. They'll be like, yes, sir, or no, ma'am. Other times they're just like as between a, in a portrait of the artist, the way that Stephen and his family interacted was much less respectful and more chaotic. Anyways, back to the school situation. Stephen is teaching a short day because it's some kind of holiday. So he doesn't do much teaching. He's really just at the school to uh, teach for about an hour and then let the kids go on the playground and play their sports. But he has to help one student who is not very good at math. So Mr. DC, his boss, has sent this kid to Stephen to work on his math a little. He helps him with the problems. Stephen sees in the kid himself when he was young. He sees him struggling. It's a little uh, way of flashing back to a portrait of the artist as a young man if you haven't read that book. And, um, but once the kid leaves, Stephen meets with his boss, Mr. Deasy, and he, Mr. Deasy is really the character who is uh, representing Nestor from the Odyssey. But you're going to see that Mr. Deasy is not that wise. He's full of these really generic cliche platitudes, and his wisdom is not really wisdom that Stephen can buy into. He actually gives Stephen this letter about um, the cattle industry in Ireland and how there's foot and mouth disease and how he knows through his family and friend connections a way to cure this foot and mouth disease. And Stephen is just, he looks at this letter and he could tell he's just not interested in it at all. But he promises Mr. DC that he'll take the letter to his friends in the newspaper office and he will do that in the Aeolus episode later on. But for now, he talks with Mr. DC who can see some things about Stephen that are pretty accurate. For one, that Stephen will not work at the school for very long. This is true. And also that he wasn't really cut out to be a teacher, that he's just there, but he's not really committed to it and interested in it. This is uh, one of those parts I was talking about before, about Stephen knowing that he has this vision and this uh, dream and artistic uh, highness <laughs> in him that he wants to release somehow in a book or something in poetry, but he's not quite there yet. But DC can at least see that, and in a sense, that is uh, accurate. And I wouldn't know, know if I'd call it wisdom, but it is accurate. And when he's paying Stephen his uh, salary, uh, I forget how much it is, about $400, I think, in today's money, I want to say. And throughout this day, Stephen's going to blow it quite a bit on uh, drinking and just uh, messing around. So he, he doesn't hang on to his money for very long. And uh, Mr. DC can see that he's not very good with money. Stephen recalls in his head all these people that he owes debts to, and it's a lot of money. And Mr. DC says, um, you know what Shakespeare said? Put money in thy purse. And Stephen says, Iago. And Iago, if you haven't read or seen the play Othello, is the villain. He's one of the most nefarious, um, double-dealing, wicked characters in Shakespeare. And he has a famous line, which is, I am not who I am, or I am not what I am. We're going to talk about this a lot more as it connects to the book, to Joyce, to characters and their relationship with the author. And uh, even though we can say that he's, Stephen's based on Joyce, is he Joyce? And this is something that I want you to start thinking about, because is Iago, the most villainous character in, or one of them in Shakespeare, is he part of Shakespeare? And as it connects, we're going to see it later on a lot more in the uh, chapter that Stephen gives the lecture on Shakespeare. So I'll hold that off for now, but just start thinking about these things. Stephen was well-versed in both Plato, Aristotle, who he knows very well, and he talks a lot about more in the next chapter. Uh, he has ideas of platonic forms and ideas emerging, and also Thomas Aquinas, who I don't know as well, but I'm somewhat familiar with his attempt to reconcile you know, these Greek thinkers and the Christian tradition. So Stephen was well-versed in all these ideas, and also start thinking about what is it that Stephen actually believes and what is his connection with uh, the Christian uh, background that he was raised in and how does he still uh, incorporate that into his ideas even if he's not 
100% with the church and so on. So just thoughts to think of now as you head forward into this chapter. Um, so after Mr. DC uh, gives them this long spiel and advice and so on, as Stephen starts to leave and head off into the world and to meet uh, his friends at the library and so on, Mr. DC calls him back and he says, because he's been talking about the threat to Ireland from the Jews, and he says, do you know why Ireland has never persecuted the Jews? And his answer is, because she never let them in. Ha ha ha. So um, this is another example similar to Haynes in the first chapter of this anti-Semitism. A lot of writers like to point out, though, that uh, there were, in fact, Jews in Ireland and Obviously, that is the case, as we'll see in the next chapter with uh, Leopold Bloom. Although Bloom's identity is also interesting in that we can ask, is he a Jew? And he even asks that later, later in the book. But hold off on that for now. The important thing to understand is that there were about, I've heard the number of 4,000 or so Jews in Ireland in the 1904 when this book takes place. Keep that in mind. But just view that uh, these people like Haynes, like Mr. DC, have these very uh, strict uh, stereotypes about what they are and how they behave and how they should be treated. That's where this, the basic shell of this chapter is. I'm going to talk a little more in the next video about some of the notes I have taken. But otherwise, uh, I think you have a, a general idea of what happens in this chapter and we're ready to go ahead. So let's go! Mm -hmm.